Good evening, my friends. Can you hear me? All righty. Thank you for being here on this Friday night. My name's David Gordon. I love standing here in this room and talking with you. It's one of the most fun things I've ever done. It's the only place on the planet I would rather, there's no place on the planet I would rather be than standing right here with you. Uh, I want to thank, as always, and for our last lecture, I want to thank uh, ampmedia.org, Channel 27. They're a wonderful community media organization that serves our whole region. They provide television broadcasts and production services to public and educational and government organizations and nonprofits can partner with them as we have. And we thank all the folks at AMP Media. And we also thank our own tech crew member, Jason Mariani, who's interfaced for us in this whole project for the second year in a row. He is the best. He's also got the most infectious smile of anybody I've ever met. And that I appreciate very much. Um, you have about 24 hours left to visit the Art of Music Art Raffle. This is the last time I get to hype it in public. It's right up at the Marjorie Evans Gallery, the upper patio. Those of you who have heard my lectures already can probably repeat verbatim with me the whole description of it. 130 some miniature artworks um, who, that have been donated by regional artists to the festival. The festival receives 100% of the proceeds and it's a wonderful, wonderful fundraising event for us. And the lucky winners get to take the artwork home that they, that they have won by putting their raffle ticket in the box. Um, there's a volunteer standing right back there and I can't see your face, but I can sure see the red apron and that's your clue. The volunteer with the red apron is selling raffle tickets. They're $5 each. You can also get a free raffle ticket if you bought our color program book. Uh, it's toward the front there. It's printed in the book. It's, there, it's, it's there, in the back? In the back. I, it, I had a 50-50 chance of getting that right. <laughs> it's in the back. Uh, and there's a little brochure, a little uh, uh, symbol there, and then they'll cross it off when they give you your, your raffle ticket. Um, I also want to mention one last time the banners. Uh, I knew Nancy Morrow for many, many years. I was sort of an unofficial member of her family. And Nancy Morrow is the person who, for decades, made the beautiful banners that, that are used in our mission concert processionals. And this has been the banner year to kind of look back at the history of the festival. We have been looking at all the things that make the festival unique, and the banners are one of those things. And uh, my wife, Jenna, and her team of volunteers have worked all winter uh, renovating and restoring all these banners that had been uh, repaired behind the scenes over the years with masking tape and electrician's tape and safety pins and paper clips and staples. So, so the banners have been refurbished. And then Jenna and her friend, Joan Hughes, created the five by seven quilted banner, which is a brand new thing that hangs over the steps from the lower lobby to the upper lobby. And I always like to look at my dear wife and smile and say, boy, was it fun watching you make that this spring. Um, it's, a, it's an impressive thing. It's even more impressive when it's lying on your plain ordinary dining room table at home. <laughs> and our dining room table is round, so that it made it even more interesting. So thanks, Jenna, for being part of all of this. Um, you know, I talked last night before the uh, mandolin concert. I, I, I mentioned cave paintings in France. I went back that far in music history. Um, those early musical instruments, basically three kinds of musical instruments, the kind you blow through, the kind you pluck or do something with a string, and the kind you hit. And basically there are, there are several reasons to make music, to worship, to heal, to entertain, just for starters. And the entertaining, since the beginning of time, the entertaining part of music making has involved dancing to music. There's practically no culture that doesn't dance to music. And that's just as true of the Baroque as any other time. In fact, in the Baroque, it was very common to base musical compositions on recognizable dance forms. And the, the various kinds of dances, the minuet, the gavotte, the gigue, the sarabande, the passacaglia, the bourree, they inspired composers, especially in the Baroque era. And Johann Sebastian Bach is a very good example of that. Although the influence of 
dance is most obvious in his suites for keyboard and the suites for orchestra, one of which begins this concert tonight. Dance-like gestures and identifiable dance forms are present in Bach's work in every genre that he wrote in, including some of his sacred choral music. The first aria in the St. Matthew Passion, sung by the alto, Bus und Roy, is very clearly a minuet. And there's a whole psychological reason that I could go into if this were a St. Matthew Passion lecture for why he picked a minuet at that point. But here, I, I'm talking tonight about the dance as it applies to his orchestral suites. Bach and Handel wrote music in what we call stylized dances. These were intended to be listened to, but they were not intended for actual dancing. The dances followed their particular stylistic norms, but they allowed for much more musical elaboration and ornamentation that would have been possible if the dance had been written for people to dance to. Johann Sebastian Bach wrote a number of orchestral suites, but only four of them have survived. I always like to remind people so that we don't take Bach for granted is that nearly half of all the music he wrote in his life was lost soon after he died because almost none of it was published. It existed only in manuscripts. The manuscripts were divided among his sons. Some of them were very responsible, like Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, his oldest, her oldest composer's son and most famous uh, composer's son, uh, and others that were a little less responsible, like Wilhelm Friedemann, uh, either threw it away, sold it, or wrote his own music on the back of it. So we have only four orchestral suites, and he's known to have composed more. The original full score for the orchestral suite we're hearing tonight does not exist. It had been lost. And it was reconstructed by musicologists by finding the various individual instrumental parts, violin one, violin two, viola. They put it together and created the full score, which we now have as the authoritative version of, of this work. Um, this, we often thought, we, we, I was taught as a student that these orchestral suites were written during the period in Curtin where he worked for the Prince of Curtin, which was the last secular job he had before moving to Leipzig in, in 1723 where he spent the last 27 years of his life. We now think they were actually the product of his early years in Leipzig and that he wrote them for performance at Zimmermann's Cafe House. The suite number four is scored for exactly the forces that he had in his Collegium Musicum, which was the music club that met on Friday nights in Zimmermann's Cafe House in Leipzig. Zimmermann's Cafe House was a very large place, probably twice as big as this room. And in the summer, they moved outside the town walls to a candlelit beer garden. Anybody who's ever been under the linden trees in Germany on a sunny night, on one of the rare balmy sunny nights in northern Germany, knows how pleasant it can be to hear music in a place like that. And just imagine if Johann Sebastian Bach were the band leader. Uh, they made these weekly concerts there, and this is the ensemble that they had. They had oboes, bassoons, string, continuo, and trumpets. And that, these, were the, uh, these were the musicians that he had to work with. They were, they were musicians from the university, uh, musicians, just independent musicians in the town and musicians from his church, churches. They all, all his orchestral suites use traditional French dance forms. And this dance suite format traces its origin to the early Baroque period in France, before Bach's generation. Notably in the keyboard works of the celebrated harpsichordist and organist and composer and teacher Francois Couperin, who was just a little bit younger than Bach. It is Couperin's basic way of organizing the short movements in this suite with keys and tempos that's the origin of the dance suite of Bach. Bach knew of the music of other composers. Great composers of the time knew of each other's music, even if that music had not been published. We knew before, before the trunk full of music of Antonio Vivaldi was discovered in 1939, most of what we knew about Vivaldi was because Bach had studied Vivaldi and had copied a lot of music. And a lot of the works of Vivaldi that we knew 
uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we knew because Bach knew them. Bach and many other composers of the time taught themselves to be composers by copying other people's music, just like a painter sitting in the, in the art museum copying an old master and teaching himself or herself the brushstrokes that way. That's the way the composers learned. And so we know that Bach knew of the Italian style. We know that Bach knew of the particular French style. And that style comes through in these suites. These are very Frenchified suites. All four of the suites were known as overtures in Bach's time. And they share similar features. They all include an elaborate, multi-part French overture, which is usually in three parts. It begins with a grand, expansive, dotted rhythm. Then it moves into a faster rhythm. And then it comes grandly expansive again. When Felix Mendelssohn played this on the keyboard for the poet Goethe, Goethe shut his eyes and said that he could imagine a great crowd of noble people grandly descending a staircase. So I want you to think about that tonight as you listen. You may have your entirely different own image in your head, but it's wonderful to let this music, which is just purely entertaining music, just transport you away. Uh, the overture is followed by a number of stylized dance movements. Again, not meant to be danced to, but meant to be listened to. There are two bourrées, which is a French dance in a quick double meter. One, two, one, two, one, two. Then there's a gavotte, which is originally a folk dance, but was later adopted in court. And this is, a, this is in four, four, but the strong beat is on three. One, two, three, four, one. Three, four, one. Three, four, one. That's a gavotte, for example. We, we recognize these dance movements in almost all of Bach's music. The final chorus of the St. Matthew Passion is a sarabande. The, um, the first alto aria, as I mentioned, is a minuet. These were simply recognizable building blocks that the composers used. There are two minuets, which is a triple. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. There are two minuets, which are these elegant dances in triple meter. Uh, and then the final movement, which is not a dance form, has the delightful name réjouissance, or rejoicing. And timpani and trumpets are brought in. Uh, there's this wonderful celebratory effect at the very end. I believe, and I don't think it's, I, I think it's entirely defensible statement that in the hands of Bach, this whole idea of the orchestral suite as it originated in France comes to a peak of perfection, of expressiveness and elegance. One of the subtle threads in this year's festival is that we have performed in various concerts all four of these orchestral suites. And uh, this is a chance to hear this last, and actually this one tends to be my favorite even though the famous uh, air in G is from uh, the suite number three. I, I like this one because of the festive ending, because I do really feel a re rejoicing and rejuvenation at the end. We move then from the stylized dance of the orchestral suites into music that actually was written to be danced to. And this is the orchestral suite <laughs> from the complete ballet music for Pulcinella by Igor Stravinsky. Igor Stravinsky is described in Grove's Dictionary of Music as a Russian-born American composer. I love saying things like that. I love, I love uh, calling George Friedrich Handel a, an English composer born in Germany, because that's what the reference books say. Stravinsky identified himself as an inventor of music and the novelty and power and elegance of his work won him worldwide admiration before he reached the age of 30. Throughout his life, he kept entering into new phases in his, in his composition, and he continued to surprise admirers with transformations of his style, and they stimulated lots and lots of controversy. Igor Fedorovich Stravinsky was born near St. Petersburg, Russia, on the 17th of June, 1882. His father 
was a star of the Imperial Opera in St. Petersburg, but the opera singer father expected the boy to become a bureaucrat. So Igor dutifully finished a few law courses before he firmly made the decision to become a musician. By this time, he was a very good amateur pianist. He was an occasional professional accompanist. And he was a great enthusiast of avant-garde music from France and Germany. And he was a connoisseur of French, Italian, and Russian opera. He never attended a formal music conservatory. But he did uh, arrange to study privately for a good long time with the great Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, among other teachers in Russia. The great Russian impresario, Sergei Diaghilev, heard Stravinsky's works in St. Petersburg in the first decade of the 20th century. And he invited Stravinsky to come to Paris to write music for a ballet company that Diaghilev had formed called the, the Russian Ballet, Les Ballets Russes. The first three ballets Stravinsky wrote for Diaghilev absolutely scandalized the musical world and brought him to international fame. They were three grand scale, large orchestra ballets that were revolutionary in every way. In 1910, The Firebird. In 1911, Petrushka. And then in 1913, the grand finale, The Rite of Spring, Le Sacre du Printemps. This was a work so radical and so controversial that it famously provoked fistfights in the auditorium during the concert. <laughs> it's a fabulous story to read about the premiere of Le Sacre du Printemps, the Rite of Spring, in Paris in 1913. There was, there was this camp that wanted it this way and this camp that defended this, and there was the, the traditionalists and the modernists and the avant-gardists, and they actually came to physical blows while the music was being played. <laughs> I, I, and part of me is thrilled that people could be so involved <laughs> in, in their opinions about the music. I, I personally want people to have opinions about the music. I don't want them to wait for me to tell them what to feel. I'll give you this information, and you can react to the music any way you want, and I want you to do that, including not liking it. It's OK to not like a piece of music. That's why they make chocolate and vanilla. I like both chocolate and vanilla, but I don't like <laughs> strawberry ice cream. So there you go. So this work, The Rite of Spring in 1913 by Igor Stravinsky, transformed the way subsequent 20th century composers thought about rhythmic structure and was largely responsible for Stravinsky's enduring reputation as a musical revolutionary who pushed the boundaries of, of musical design. This early phase of his career is known as his Russian phase. And then, toward 1920, he began to be interested in the music of the 18th century. And this we call now his neoclassical phase that began with the music we're hearing tonight and ended around the time he wrote his wonderful opera, The Rake's Progress, which has a harpsichord in the orchestra. Um, the works from this neoclassical period, roughly 30 years or so, um, tend to make use of traditional musical forms. He became much more traditional in his source inspiration. The Concerto Grosso, the Fugue, the traditional 18th century symphony, and his works often pay tribute to some older master. And that, that is where this music comes from tonight. In the spring of 1919, Diaghilev suggested to Stravinsky that Stravinsky write a ballet based on some music by Pergolesi, who was an early Baroque composer from Italy. Stravinsky turned him down at first because he wasn't particularly fond of the little bit of Pergolesi's music that he had heard. And then Diaghilev dug up some manuscripts from some libraries in Italy and brought them to Stravinsky. And these caught Stravinsky's fancy, and so he agreed to the idea. This was, uh, uh, this was I say, was his first neoclassical work. And he took the manuscripts and wrote onto them. So if you see the original pieces, 
And I, I've heard, I've performed in concerts, I've performed the complete ballet music, which involves three singers. And then we've also done some of the music that he derived his inspiration from. And if you look at Stravinsky's score, you can see the, the skeleton inside it of the original work over which he has laid the stuff that comes from Igor Stravinsky's imagination. Um, he would later remark, Polchinella was my discovery of the past. It was the epiphany through which all the rest of my music became possible. That's the music we're hearing tonight. He formed this musical pastiche based on works by Pergolesi. We now know that some of those works were erroneously attributed to Pergolesi, or actually by other composers, but they are legitimate Italian Baroque works. He drew on all kinds of different art forms, or musical forms, trio sonatas, instrumental suites, opera arias, and through various musical means, he adapted these by slightly lengthening, slightly shortening, cutting, putting new music, changing the harmonies, and leaving somehow an underlying foundation of the original piece. The earlier ballets that I mentioned to you, the revolutionary ones, were written for huge orchestras and had very, very innovative tone colors, clashing rhythms. Pulcinella is relatively simple and sparse. The original ballet was 20 movements, scored for an orchestra of 33, plus three vocal soloists, soprano, tenor, and baritone. And Pulcinella sticks mostly to rhythmic patterns established in the 18th century. But even though, as I say, even though Stravinsky used Pergolesi, Pergolesi's melodies and bass lines with little change, he puts his own unmistakable stamp on top of them. The work was premiered in 1920 at the Paris Opera, and it is one of the performances that I have studied that I really wish I could have attended. Uh, of course, Diaghilev produced it. Leonid Massin, the great dancer, was the choreographer. And the sets and costumes, my friend, were by Pablo Picasso. Can you imagine? At the Paris Opera, the old Paris Opera. Um, the inspiration is the Commedia dell'arte, the, the, the music theater, uh, traditional improvised music theater and its stock characters. Pulcinella is the character that in the puppet show we call Punch. Um, and it was, this, these were well-known characters in the 19th century and long before. And this, um, this, these characters uh, in the actual ballet, there's an interplay and there's a kind of a vague storyline and three, as I say, three singers sing from the orchestra pit with the orchestra while the ballet's danced on stage. In 1922, because the piece was so successful, he wanted to create, like many smart composers do, he wanted to create a way of having the piece performed in orchestra concerts without having the whole ballet. And so he created an orchestral suite he reduced the number of movements from 20 to 11. He eliminated the vocal solos. This orchestral suite was premiered by Serge Kuzovitsky and the Boston Symphony in 1922, and this is the music we hear tonight. Stravinsky settled in West Hollywood. He spent more time living in Los Angeles than any other city in the world. He became a naturalized American citizen in 1945. In 1969, he moved to the Essex House Hotel in New York where he lived until his death in 1971 at age 88. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and in 1987, he was posthumously awarded a Grammy for lifetime achievement. <laughs> a Grammy and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And before I leave Stravinsky, I want to, I want to make you aware of one other connection that we have with Mr. Stravinsky. As you know, I've immersed the last 12 months of my life in studying the history of the arts in this town, especially Dean Denny and Hazel Watrous. In 1927, they formed an organization called the Carmel Music Society. And that organization has been presenting great musical artists here ever since then. In 1935, ladies and gentlemen, in the fall of 1935, Igor Stravinsky played a piano recital in Sunset Center. Imagine that. Uh, that and the Hollywood Walk of Fame star. I mean, it's just, it's amazing when the, the, the lives, the turns and corners of the lives of some of these great people that we take for granted. And when I find stuff like that that helps me to not take them for granted, 
the first thing I think of doing is sharing it with you. <laughs> then we come to the third composer on this concert. And this music was not written to be danced to. And it is not exactly based on dance forms. But it is written by a composer who was deeply influenced by the 18th century, who considered himself a classicist, who is a great lover of the music of Bach. And that, of course, is Johannes Brahms. Brahms was born in 1833 in Hamburg. He died in 1897 in Vienna, where he actually lived most of his life. He wrote Symphony No. 1 over a period of 22 years, his first symphony. And if you know the first symphony of Johannes Brahms, it is a great heavy thing. It's in it's been described as a, a, a slab of granite in C minor. <laughs> he composed it in these agonizing, agonized bursts of activity over a period of two decades. And he halted at various points for what seemed like some kind of existential hand wringing because he was so in the shadow of his hero, Ludwig van Beethoven. He said, you have no idea how it is for the likes of us to feel the dread of a giant like him just behind us. So when he finally produced, what he finally produced in, in 1877, uh, at, at the age of 44, was a, this giant hunk of minor sonority. It's, it's got a place in the symphonic literature, but to me it's got just a whiff of self-conscious portentousness of a, of a young man who's trying to convince himself, whistling in the dark, that he deserves to write a symphony, even though Beethoven is looking over his shoulder. Consider that um, this, that at this, you know, when, 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 uh, when, when Brahms moved to Vienna, there were still people there who knew Beethoven. And he knew people who had known and worked with Beethoven, and he was totally intimidated by the thought of Beethoven, the great symphonist. The, this great hurdle having been cleared, he went on a vacation to a beautiful place in Austria called the Wörthersee. Austria was my home for a number of years, and Wörthersee is a very beautiful place. When the sun shines there, it's like the sun shining in Carmel. You're very appreciative of it, and it makes everything wonderful. <laughs> After taking 22 years to write his first symphony, he wrote his second symphony, the one we hear tonight, in six weeks. It just flew out of him. Now, here we have a really interesting part of Brahms, because Brahms had a well-known streak of melancholy. There was a well-known flavor, a tang of melancholy that went through his music and through his life. His friends talk about it, and music lovers are familiar with it. Uh, I think of the incredible poignancy of the Requiem, or even the, some of his chamber music, the Horn Trio. It has this wonderful bittersweet quality to it. And so everyone was waiting to see what he would produce with his second symphony after having experienced the first symphony. He wrote a letter to Simrock, his publisher, and he said, I have published, I'm, I have written the saddest piece of music that I've ever created. It is so melancholy that you will not be able to bear it. I have never written anything so sad. I believe that the score should come out draped in black. <laughs> well, this is because the symphony that you're going to hear tonight is so happy, is so lovely and bright, that even Brahms made a joke about it. Even Brahms was aware of how unlike him this symphony was. He was, he was a classicist. He, he revered the formal structures of the 18th century, and he translated them into 19th century use. So you hear the crispness, the crisp rhythms of the 18th century. When you study 18th century music, especially the music of the Baroque, the first thing you have to analyze is the rhythms. Then the melody will begin to fall into place. But when we analyze Bach's music, we first analyze the rhythms. And thus, in the second symphony, Brahms preserves some of these structural elements from the 18th century symphonic pioneers. There are two lively outer movements, 
framing a slow second movement, and a third movement that is designated scherzo. Scherzo simply means in Italian, joke. It simply is a designation for a, a, a free form movement that is bright and cheery. The premiere of Brahms' Second Symphony was given on the 30th of December in 1877 in Vienna under the direction of Hans Richter. Mozart's blood flows through this entire symphony. There is no doubt that this symphony is also, has also one of the most utterly affirmative finale endings of any symphony. When I was growing up, I learned to love classical music by listening to orchestral repertoire. And I found it in, in my early teen years that Beethoven, I wasn't quite ready for Beethoven, but I was very ready for Brahms. And I remember the first time I heard this symphony and how good it made me feel. Um, there, this symphony where, the, where the, second, the first symphony was agonized, this second symphony is like a warm summer breeze with woodwinds glowing under the, under the burnished violin sound. I would compare it, most of all, to the sixth symphony of Beethoven, the wonderful pastoral symphony of Beethoven, which breathes a similar air of contentment. Um, one of the reasons we designated, we, we, we give titles to our concerts uh, for marketing and artistic inspiration, and we call this music of dance. Not because all three pieces were written to be danced to. One of them was. And not because the first piece was written to be danced to. It is stylized dances. And certainly nobody wrote, uh, Brahms did not write his second symphony to be danced to, but the music has always made me feel like dancing. It's the brightness of the rhythms, the brightness of the sonorities, a full spectrum sonority from the deep basses to the high treble. And most of all, this, this uh, energy, this bright forward moving energy, which reminds us of the 18th century masters, especially Mozart. And so what I want you to explore tonight, if you're closing your eyes and playing the Goethe moment and thinking of who it is you see coming down the stairway when Bach's orchestral suite begins. I want you to see if it makes your toes tap. I want you to see if your toes tap to the orchestral suite rhythms, to the incredible rhythms of Stravinsky's Polchinella. Imagine the, the, um, the costume. I keep thinking about the costumes and sets by Pablo Picasso in 1920 at the Paris Opera. And what a hotbed of of the arts that must have been in Paris at that time. And then to our dear friend, our dear sweet friend with his bright blue eyes, Johannes Brahms in 1877 in Vienna, coming out with a piece of music that it was so unlike what everyone expected that even he made a joke about it. There's your scherzo, ladies and gentlemen, for tonight. Um, I want to say to you, um, thank you for sharing your time with me here. This is the 12th lecture I've given on this spot. I love doing this. And I want to thank you for celebrating our 75th Carmel Bach Festival. I invite you back next year when I will be celebrating my 25th Carmel Bach Festival. And I hope to see you all there. Thanks a whole lot. Good night. Wow.